Welcome to our video on modes of column failure. <clears throat> Columns fail in one of two uh, broad categories. One is yielding of the material, which we sometimes call crushing. This may involve plastic flow if it's a ductile material like steel, or if it's a brittle material like concrete, it will involve shattering. We also have another mode of failure which is very common and very dangerous because it actually occurs uh, well below the yield stress of the material. It involves elastic instability, or the short terminology that we use for that is buckling. <clears throat> we can have overall buckling of a column because the column is too long and slender to be stiff enough to keep itself under the load. Or we can also have local buckling where part of the column gives up and at that point it transfers its load to another part of the column that's still there and depending upon how high that load is and how strong the remaining part of the column is it may or may not fail. Um, <clears throat> this is a common diagrammatic way of uh, expressing the idea of a column. <coughs> Here we have what we call a short fat column or more specifically a column with fat proportions. Um, you'll notice the implication here is that it was a straight rod and now it's begun to pancake out as yielding of the material is taking place. Over on this side, we have a long slender column. Um, you'll notice it took a very large force to crush this material or make the material yield. It may take a very tiny force to cause this thing to buckle if we've made this column too slender. So we have a column with slender proportions here and a column with fat proportions here. An example of a slender column, and by the way, um, this is sort of a diagrammatic representation. All of this stuff that's drawn around here is supposed to represent something that's bracing this column. So the implication is this column can't sway from side to side, but the fact that these things are coming in and just barely restraining it and not really clamping around it means that we can develop some slope at this point. And also we've kind of represented the tip down here as beveled suggesting a pin joint so in fact slope can be developed here also so when buckling occurs it takes this shape right here which happens to be half of a sine wave we call this a pin pinned column and of course if you don't restrain it with something else at the top a pin pin column just falls over of its own accord so we sometimes say a pin pin column with no sway at the top but we usually don't add that terminology because we understand that a pin pin column will fall over if it's not properly restrained against sway <clears throat> a classic example where we might see a slender pin pin column is one of the interior columns of a big box store <clears throat> which typically has shear walls all around, which handle any kind of lateral forces like wind or seismic. And there's a tall volume inside with lightly loaded columns because the columns are only carrying the roof load. So we have tall or long columns and light loads. So they tend to be fairly small in their lateral dimension. And as a consequence, they tend to have slender proportions. Um, a classic example of a fat pin pin column would be at the base of the original World Trade Center. And uh, this is an image of that building. Um, it's a fairly poor image in some ways because this tube around the outside consists of huge numbers of columns which are welded to really thick spandrel beams all the way around. They're not properly represented in this diagram. Also, what's happening at the corners here is uh, 
totally inadequately represented, but what I want you to think of this tower is very much like a big box store. The big box store is surrounded by concrete block and brick walls, which provide wonderful shear walls. And in essence, they are like tubular versions of the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center, of course, has lots of windows on the outside, so it's not totally opaque uh, shear wall like a big box that's made out of uh, concrete masonry units. But for all intents and purposes, this super rigid frame is like a shear wall and it's forming a tube that goes all the way around this building and that is the only source of lateral stability. So all the interior columns in the World Trade Center were pure gravity columns. They had no uh, shear connection between them, uh, excuse me, no shear walls, no triangulation, no moment connections or anything. They were a classic example of pin-pin columns, except they're incredibly tall columns, which are braced at every floor. So the sine curve basically goes one way on one floor, the next way on the next floor, and so forth snaking its down through its way down through the building. These columns down near the base were enormous. Um, two or three feet, feet thick in any given direction and they're braced every 15 feet or so. So a column like that is not a slender column and it would fail by crushing. So here we have an example of an apparatus that we used for a few years. It basically consists of this plywood uh, platform, which rides up and down on these aluminum rods. <clears throat> and in the case of this, uh, we had hose clamps that we clamped around the rods, somewhat down uh, from where the platform was being held by the column when the column was straight. So this, uh, clear acrylic tube is the column we're testing. It started off straight. We began to load it. And for this long version, it only took this much weight to collapse it. So um, these are five and a half pound weights. Those are five and a half pound weights. Uh, so these little ones on the top are all two and a half, which gives you some kind of an indicator of the relative strength. So here we have a slender version, which is failing under a very modest load. And then we have the shorter version down here, which has actually started to buckle and has been stopped mercifully by these hose clamps around the rods. <clears throat> but you'll notice the enormous weight. These are 25 pounders. Those are five pounders. So we got two 25s and a whole slew of 10s. Um, and in the case of these columns, we saw buckling here, and we did see some evidence of buckling there, although um, usually these shorter versions just kind of shattered and exploded because acrylic is a brittle material. The key point here is the long slender column is buckling at a much lower load than the shorter, the column with fatter proportions. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so if we have a long column and we want to give it fat proportions, the way we do it is we increase its breadth. Uh, and we have a technical term we use for that. It's called the radius of gyration, which we represent with the letter R. But for our purposes, we're going to, for the moment, we're going to speak in terms of this sort of general concept of breadth. So there are various ways we can give a column breadth. Here we've taken a three inch by one sixteenth inch piece of yellow styrene <clears throat> and configured it in a variety of ways. For example, here's the three by one sixteenth. If we cut that in seven strips that are the same width and glue them together, we can make this solid rod version. Uh, we can cut it into three strips and make the triangular tube. We can cut it into four strips and make the square tube. All these things have exactly that amount of material in them. Three inches by one sixteenth of an inch. <clears throat>
And then we can take that and we can split it down the middle. We can make an angle. We can make an angle with a squared off base, with a bevel base, and with a, a base that comes to a point. So we did a series of tests. The first was with this just basic three inch wide strip of material, which not surprisingly won't even stand up as a column. Uh, therefore it has zero load carrying capacity. Um, the next likely candidate in terms of weakness would be this solid rod. So we did some testing of that. So here we see the 7 16th inch by 7 16th inch solid rod. Uh, it held about 15 pounds when we account for the weight of this platform plus the weight of what's on it. And here we see it in the classic half sine wave of a simple pin pin column that's in the process of buckling collapse. Now again, I remind you there are hose clamps under here, uh, clamp tight around these rods so that only so much movement could occur. And when we used to do these experiments, we actually were able to repeat them for about eight or 10 years before we finally did enough damage to these columns. And that's a really crucial point that the material has not yielded. And in fact, this column hasn't been destroyed yet because if we take that weight off, the column will bounce back. And year after year, we were able to test this column and year after year, we got essentially the same load at uh, failure. This is a classic example of overall failure. Um, so the key point here is that we haven't yielded the material. We're not even close to being able to take advantage of the stress capacity of this material because basically it's not being held under the load and it's not stiff enough to hold itself under the load. And so it's changing shape catastrophically. If those hose clamps weren't there, this entire structure would have continued on, collapsed, developed momentum, and then this column would have been mangled and yielded and it would not return to its original shape. So it's kind of like a coat hanger. If you bend it a little bit, it goes back to its original shape. You bend it too much and the material yields and it doesn't go back. The key point is that this collapse that's in progress here has been initiated by elastic instability and not by crushing of the material. <clears throat> now we can take that same amount of material and put it into a triangular shape. And we go from 15 pounds of capacity up to 95 pounds. So increasing the breadth has had a huge and dramatic effect. We've gone all, all the way from the thin sheet of material that didn't even work as a column to the rod, which was highly localized and didn't have much breadth. Now we're up to a triangular cross section and it's now holding 95 pounds. <clears throat> we can do a square cross section. It's not a huge or dramatic improvement. It's from 95 to 115. And if we had been able to go to a circular version, we'd have probably gotten up to 120 or maybe 125. But square in this case is very close to optimal. And uh, of course, we were not able to do a legitimate test for a circular cross section because we didn't have a way to fabricate the material without melting it um, or, or deforming it in some way that would affect the molecular structure of it or the structural integrity of it. And we wouldn't have known how to make the comparison. So we had to settle for this as kind of the closest that we could get to a circular cross section. Now, all these columns that we've been talking about so far are pin pinned. And um, relative to this issue of buckling, the failure stress or what we sometimes call the critical axial stress for buckling is given by this expression. <clears throat> First of all, there's a pi square here. Um, don't worry about that. That's a constant that falls out of the scientific theory. Uh, pi squared is about 10 roughly, but um, that's a number that exists that we have to deal with. E 
is the material stiffness. So you'll recall that it's a ratio, for example, of the stress that's applied divided by the fractional deformation that occurs. So in the case of uh, steel, E is 29 million pounds per square inch, or 29,000 kips per square inch. Um, a is the cross-sectional area of the column. And then down in the denominator is a ratio, L over R. L is length. R is some kind of indicator of breadth. So length over breadth is pretty accurately described as the slenderness ratio. So clearly, if you make the, the column twice as long, it's twice as slender, and its slenderness ratio goes up. Likewise, if you reduce the breadth, it also takes on more slender proportions. And this is a pretty sensitive function. The slenderness ratio is to the square power. <clears throat> so if you want to make a really lousy column, give it very little breadth or make it very long. But whatever you do, assure that this ratio is high. And that's a good way to produce an extremely inefficient, ineffective column. Now, so far, we've talked about um, primarily about closed sections. We wanted to get to a circle, but we didn't quite. We stopped short as a square. Now, sections like this are more expensive to make, uh, as we learned in our discussions of how steel pipe and tube is made. Um, in addition to that, making connections to this is sometimes difficult. You can't put a bolt all the way through it because if you do, the steel workers will crank the bolt down until they've crushed the wall of the tube. So there are a lot of reasons why we might not want to use these shapes, even though we suspect that they're uh, close to ideal in terms of resisting buckling. This is how we get a lot of breadth is by getting all the material away from the neutral axis, either this neutral axis or that one. On the other hand, um, open sections like wide flanges and angles are less expensive to manufacture. Um, the rolling process that's involved here is a lot less expensive because over here we had to roll it out into thin coil sheet or stock. Then we had to cut it to precise width then we had to run through a rolling machine that would roll it to, cl to closure. Um, then we had to weld it precisely. And then if we wanted to go from round to square, we had to take it through one more operation where we mashed it into square tube. Here we run it through a series of rollers that squash it out to the shape we want. Um, so that's a strong motive is cost. Typically, this stuff over here is going to be at least 50% more per pound. Um, but another motive is it's a lot easier to drill and bolt to these kinds of sections. We're also going to discover that for very highly loaded situations, um, such as in a 100-story building, down near the bottom, the columns are braced every 15 feet, so the length is 15 feet. But these wide flanges might be really large in cross-section, and so we don't really have any buckling problems associated with this anyway. But we want to start exploring that whole idea to kind of understand what is the difference between the dynamic of this in its buckling behavior and the dynamic of that, because these two things can be radically different. Um, as an example of uh, column-like elements, uh, here's a really ugly one, but you can see it pretty well. It's got uh, angles on the four corners and then web members bolted to them. All this is uh, sheared to, to length. The holes are punched. It's very inexpensive. It's really ugly and, and makes you feel like you're walking by a bunch of razor blades. But it gets the idea of the box truss across.
This is a much more elegant uh, version of it. Here we have uh, a trust column which has the same kind of angles except the web members are cut more cleanly and welded in so that you have a nice clean face to that column. <clears throat> so both of these are examples of where an angle is being used as a compression member. Um, here's another example. Trusses, simple span trusses, we end up with huge compressive forces in the top cord. Um, we, we like to make them out of back-to-back -back double angles because that's a really inexpensive material type and it provides excellent surfaces for welding these web members to, for example. So um, these are examples of open web materials that are very economical and logical to use for making things. <clears throat> so we're going to test a few of these columns and you'll notice here we have a bevel edge, here we have a beveled point, here we have a squared off end, and we're going to start looking at those in our column tester. So whether we put um, the beveled edge or the beveled point, we always tended to get buckling in the weak axis direction, in other words, this way rather than that way, and, and we tended to get buckling at fairly low forces. So here we've got 40 pounds for failure as compared to the 95 pounds uh, that we got for the square triangular tube and the 115 pounds that we got for the square tube. Um, <clears throat> this is that same column once we've put 40 pounds on it. It's a classic half sine curve. It's a classic example of overall buckling. And as I said, it doesn't make any difference whether this is the beveled edge or the beveled point we got about 40 pounds out of it. <clears throat> From that we went to the squared off end. The squared off end has some fixity to it, both top and bottom, and one would expect that that would fairly drastically increase the strength. And so let's talk about that for a second. Um, it turns out that um, the effective length L. L may be the length or it may be the effective length. Uh, in fact, I'm going to redo this for a moment. Let's see if I can make this work. Yes. L is whatever the actual length is and we make this a, a general equation when we throw in a factor called K and KL is called the effective length. Now the effective length actually is half a wavelength. So for example here we have half a wavelength and we would put that number in there. Now the question becomes how much do we help ourselves when we add this in fixity which may be best understood in terms of figuring out what a half a sine wave is. <clears throat> so here's our classic pin pinned no sway column. Here's a half a sine curve. So the actual length of it is lambda over 2, or the wavelength over 2. Now, if we had a true pin-pin column, it would be constrained against movement at the top, so it would be vertical, and it would be vertical down at the bottom. It would curve outward, come back inward, and become vertical again. So in other words, there's an entire sine wave from there to there, or in other words, for this particular column, instead of a half a sine wave being equal to the overall length, we have this tighter curvature and a half a sine wave length, a half a wavelength is half the length of the column. So when we go into our equation here and we're talking about uh, KL over R, um, the effective length KL for this situation is actually half as much as the effective length for that situation. Or in other words, we'd expect this column to be four times as strong as a result of this end fixity. Now, this is also just to give you a feel for what that looks like. Here's a little six inch rod made out of uh, polyvinyl chloride. <clears throat> 
Here it's pin pinned, and and we have a crushing mechanism that prevents lateral movement at the top by the virtue of this really wide, strong hinge back here. This block is just to keep it from collapsing and crushing. Here we have end fixity, so the rod has to go into this sturdy sleeve, which prevents it from sloping. So here we have verticality, here we have lots of slope. This is what we call moment, moment without any sway because this restrains it, which turns out to be exactly this case here. So you can see from this experimental model that it's basically replicating the geometry that's drawn in that diagram. Now, something interesting happened when we conducted the experiment on the yellow column. We said if overall buckling is the issue, then fixing the ends of the column should increase the critical load for buckling by a factor of four. In other words, we should go from the 40 pounds that crushed, or excuse me, that buckled um, the pin-pin version of this column, we should go from that 40 pounds to 160. However, something strange happened along the way. You'll notice this column has begun to deform in a rather odd way. The original corner is still very straight, but portions of the column have begun to twist or exhibit a torsional deformation. Now, we look at that torsional deformation, we think that's the crucial issue. The actual crucial issue is that the outer legs of these angles are not stabilized well enough. And so one of them wants to buckle and the other one says, well, I want to buckle also, but they're connected together at the corner. So they conspire together and they say, well, as long as we both go in the direct, same direction, we won't inhibit each other and we can both buckle the way we want to. What was interesting about this experiment is that normally in, a, in most structural situations, when some portion of the cross section gives up, like these outer legs here and there, um, we call that local buckling. And typically when that happens, the transfer of load to the remaining part of the column causes it to collapse. In the case of this particular column configuration though, the material near the corner is still stable enough that it's holding up the load. So we're actually able to see this torsional buckling mode or failure mode frozen in time because the column didn't actually collapse totally once it started. Uh, this is a view down towards the bottom. You'll notice the straightness of the corner there, but these portions out here have begun to exhibit this odd behavior. This column now failed at only 60 pounds. And the reason it failed at that instead of 160 is once we had stabilized the column against overall buckling, local buckling took over and became the limiting factor. And this final uh, failure mode is really quite twisted and grotesque. And we eventually had to give up doing this experiment because this particular column just took too much abuse and eventually the glue joint failed. Now, you may think this is all due to the fact that there's this angle has legs only on sort of towards one side and it's not truly symmetric. So to demonstrate that's not true, we're going to do effectively what's like two angles back to back, or in other words, this cruciform column. We got two of them here. Here's one. There's another. We're going to go put that in our column tester. And once we drive up the loads, you'll notice things are not straight anymore. The outer edge is developing this sort of snaky distortion. And you can see it both from this view and from this one where the outer edge is basically failed. It's transferred its load back to the material that's that's glued together near the intersection and that material is still holding. So again, we're observing this effect that some local buckling occurs and there's still enough capacity left in the column. You shouldn't rely on this as a, as a sort of notification of failure.
or a warning sign because often once the local buckling occurs in one place, the column fails. <clears throat> this is just the other column being tested in a similar way. And again, we're observing similar behavior. Now, you can kind of stiffen that edge by turning it into this cruciform with some flanges on the outside. And those flanges delay the onset of this local buckling problem. However, they don't stop it. And they don't actually help a whole lot because uh, what they do is they smooth out. So here we see it when it's straight. I apologize for these fuzzy pictures. Here we see where the twist has started to occur. Um, again, this column is limited by the stability of the material down near the core. And the fact that we have initiated the buckling out near the edges, near the thin flanges at the exterior, means we've basically lost that material anyway, and we're still relying on the core. So it turned out in this case that adding this material or reconfiguring it in this way did not help that much compared to that. So you can also have local buckling in uh, some kind of a broad, flat face. So for example, here we have a square tube and we're beginning to load it, load it up and we're beginning to see some buckling. And here we're seeing the buckling in a very pronounced way. And you'll notice some interesting things. Wherever materials meet, they tend to conspire so that they don't have to break that joint. Um, in other words, the materials try to buckle in a cooperative way. So for example, here the material has buckled out. On this face, it's buckling in. On the other face in the back, it's buckling out. And then on this side over here, it's buckling in. So you're actually seeing it's almost like a bunch of angles that are connected together, one on each corner, and they're kind of working together to make this failure mode occur. We can even have this kind of local buckling in round tube. Uh, it's much less common because a curved cylindrical wall tends to be much more stable against local buckling. But if the column's fat enough um, and the forces get high enough, you'll observe this odd diamond pattern, which is the buckling mode for the thin wall tube. Um, a classic version of that is the Firth of Forth Bridge. These enormously tall tubes um, are obviously going to be vulnerable to buckling if they're not fairly large in diameter. By the time they were made large enough in diameter, to resist overall buckling, they were quite thin walled. So a way of reducing somewhat that tendency to buckle was to rivet perpendicular ribs on the inside of these. And those perpendicular ribs were intended to hinder or uh, inhibit this dimpling effect that we're seeing in, in the walls. So this is, a form of local buckling that can be inhibited by stiffening it. That concludes our discussion of modes of failure in simple columns, pin pin columns that maybe that are definitely can be vulnerable to overall buckling. And if they're not configured right, can also be vulnerable to local buckling.